So tonight, no end in sight to the, well, let's call it what it is, the nightmarish misery facing Delta and anybody flying Delta tonight. They're canceling or delaying, look at this, something like 1,300 delays, 470 flights as part of the fallout from that huge IT outage that happened Friday, five days ago. And if you're like, well, wait a second, other airlines seem okay. Well, you'd be right. Delta says it's been getting hit uniquely hard because more than half its systems run on the software that was affected. It's partly why the Department of Transportation is now, just today, opening a new investigation into Delta after the DOT fielded something like 3,000 complaints from customers related to the airline. This is according to the Transportation Secretary just a couple minutes ago, who said, and I'm quoting here, the agency will leverage the full extent of our investigative and enforcement power to ensure the rights of Delta's passengers are upheld. I am joined now by the head of that department, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Secretary Buttigieg, thank you for coming back on the show. Good to be back with you. So let's start with what triggered this whole thing. Um, in layman's terms, this like buggy software update. But here we are five days later now. Do you believe that Delta and solely Delta bears responsibility, bears the blame for the fallout now? We are investigating Delta specifically because Delta specifically seems to be having a different level of problem. Uh, as you know, organizations, companies, governments around the world were affected by that software issue on Friday. That's certainly true. The airline sector, many airlines had problems, but the other airlines got back on their feet within a day or two. Uh, Delta uh, originally told me they expected to be back to normal by today. Obviously, they are not. As you noted, hundreds of flights still canceled today. Uh, we estimate that more than half a million passengers have now been impacted. So the scope of our investigation is to determine why Delta was not able to recover the way the other airlines were, uh, whether uh, they took all the steps that they could, and uh, to understand what's going on on the customer service side. Uh, we're hearing stories about people waiting hours just to get somebody on the phone, uh, people in these long lines where there's just one or two agents there to help them, and you got got 100 people or more. Uh, many mm. of them uh, walk away and give up when actually they're in entitled to those vouchers, help with uh, ground transportation, hotels, meals, you name it. We got a lot of specific commitments from Delta and the other airlines okay. two years ago that we can now enforce. Those are uh, commitments around how they treat passengers when there's a delays or cancellations like this. Uh, we are going to hold them to that, and that's also part of this investigation. Have you spoken with Delta CEO today? Uh, not today, but I did speak with him earlier. He understands our concerns, uh, and okay. I uh, reminded him, among other things, that it's important to make clear to passengers that they are entitled to cash refunds if their mm. flight is canceled and they choose not to take a rebooking. I'm reminded um, of something that you and I talked about, I want to say last year now, Southwest, which went through a, a similar investigation, if you will, after its 2022 holiday meltdown. It was fined $140 million by the administration. Based on what you know now, do you believe Delta could be looking at something similar, a similar penalty? Well, this early in the investigation, I, I can't judge how it's going to come out. But what I okay. will say is this could absolutely lead to major enforcement action. Uh, you know, the Southwest uh, penalty, $140 million, partly in a cash fine, partly in terms of compensation going to passengers, uh, that was a record at the time. I think it was about actually 30 times uh, the toughest penalty this department ever assessed in the past because we really wanted to send a message that this is a new chapter in how we enforce passenger protections and rights. It was designed to send a message to airlines. Clearly, uh, we need to continue sending that message until these kinds of things are unthinkable. In the meantime, when some kind of disruption happens, uh, an airline has to take care of their passengers, and we're going to be looking over their shoulder to make sure they do it. If you've been caught up in this, okay. uh, uh, you know, we certainly encourage people to try to work with the airline, but go to our website, flightrights.gov. You can get information about your rights and information about how to file a complaint with us if the airline is not meeting its end of its responsibilities. Separately, and just quickly here, you have the FAA dialing up its oversight of Southwest Airlines after three incidents in which their planes apparently flew pretty dangerously close to the ground. We're showing them here in one instance as low as like 150 feet above the water near Tampa. Is there any question, Mr. Secretary, in your mind on whether Southwest planes should still be in the air? 
Well, uh, FAA will never allow a plane to go into the air if it is considered to be unsafe. Uh, when you have these issues, including uh, some of the concerns you just listed, that draws special scrutiny from FAA, and that's exactly what the FAA is doing. Uh, this is uh, an organization, a department, an agency that takes very seriously uh, the work that has made it the case that flying on a commercial airliner in the United States is the safest way to travel. There's literally no uh, safer way to travel in the world. We got to keep it that way and okay. uh, hold the airlines to keeping it that way. Everybody else in the aviation sector, that'll be FAA's focus. Understanding that you're joining us in your official capacity, sir, and I want you to stay in that lane. Let me ask you this. President Biden, as you know, has said he's not going to run for a second term. And some Republicans have suggested if, if President Biden is not fit to run again, then in their view, he would not be fit to serve out the rest of his term. As one of his cabinet members, as somebody who's involved in the business of running the government, are you comfortable with President Biden's ability to carry out the duties of the office until inauguration? Yes, and uh, I'm also more confident than ever in his consistency doing the right thing for the American people. He made uh, an incredibly difficult and selfless choice when he decided to concentrate 100 percent on the presidency for the remainder of his term and not pursue a campaign. And uh, I know that uh, he will continue to lead this administration. Uh, by the way, the vice president, in addition to obviously uh, the campaign side, will continue uh, to be a leader in this administration as vice president. And we've got our marching orders as a department to make sure mm. we sprint through the tape and spend the next six months of this term following through on everything from the thousands of projects that we are funding and getting built and increasingly breaking ground on and going into construction with through the Biden infrastructure plan, developing things like the airline passenger protections that are such an important part of our power to respond today to what's going on with Delta and countless other things to make workers, families and communities better off. There is not a moment so, to lose. Uh, I know the president feels that sense of urgency to make the most of every day in this administration. And so do I and everybody who works here at the U.S. Department of Transportation. So then what do you want to hear from him tomorrow night? What do you think Americans need to hear from him? You know, I'm looking forward to hearing him remind us of the values that guide his administration. I'm sure he'll uh, share more about the decision that he made. Uh, and I expect that he'll lay out a governing vision for the balance of his term. Again, when, when you're president of the United States, when uh, you're in any uh, role in, in government like, like this, uh, every day counts, every day matters. And I expect we'll hear from him uh, what he will continue to lead the administration and the country in achieving uh, every day that he is president up to the end of this term. Uh, I've covered the White House, as, as you know, uh, Mr. Secretary. I understand the limitations of the Hatch Act, but I would be remiss not to ask about your endorsement of Kamala Harris. Your name has been floated in that running mate conversation. If asked to serve alongside her as her VP, would you? I get why you have to ask, but as you noted, I, I can't talk about the campaign or election side, uh, although I'm enthusiastically talking about uh, other things in other venues where, where and when it's appropriate. If she asked you to stand on the cabinet, if she were to win, would you? That, let me ask you that. That's more official. Yeah, I, I think that's just too, too speculative into the future. I'm, I'm proud to be doing the job that I'm doing and uh, very focused on uh, trying to do that job well. Secretary Pete Buttigieg, thanks for joining us on a busy and newsy day on multiple fronts. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.